Let's take a look at monarchy and England in general. The uh, two are completely intertwined with one another. You can't have England without the monarchy, and you yeah. can't have the English monarchy without the English, because we it's a shared history, it's a shared heritage that we all have between one another that connects the English people to one another. And I thought it would be interesting to look at how that's going right now, because as you've mentioned, the Republicans have taken an opportunity to try and uh, stir up some controversy during this period in the most distract, uh, disrespectful manner yeah. possible. But I thought, obviously, we can't really see past this uh, paywall right here. But the most recent uh, surveys that have been done on British support for the monarchy show kind of what you would expect, which is that the older generations are far more decisively in support of it. You've got the 25 to 49 year olds, 56% support, and above that you get more and more. With the younger generations who are less supportive of it, although you do get 33% 18 to 14 year olds still in support, 31% of Republicans who want an elected head of state because yeah. that will only ever result in good leadership, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then 36% yeah. say they don't know. And if anything, that's quite good because there is an uncertainty mm -hmm. about these things that comes with youth. You're still figuring out the world. And if anything, it's good to me that these kids are saying, well, I don't know, rather than going blindly ahead with a personal self-assurance that they know exactly how the world works. Mm -hmm. I'm sure as time carries on, these younger people are going to, as many do, become more conservative, mm -hmm. learn more about their history and heritage, recognize what the traditions they uh, come from, and then probably end up supporting more and more. And the trends throughout history, throughout the, gen uh, throughout the decades, do show hope in that direction. If we go to the next one, where um, they, they say in this PBS of all places, talking about it, saying that yes, what actually tends to happen is that they tend to get more and more conservative as they get older, they get more and more monarchist, and they show more support to, mm. for the monarchy as they get older. Um, they say the pattern is not new, gap between younger and older people was much the same in 1994 as it is now, even though those people who would have been 18 to 24 back yeah, then yeah. are the monarchists nowadays, yeah. are the royalists, well, I, are the people I, who support it. Yeah, I, I would have, you know, back in my teenage years, I probably was like, oh, yeah, republics sound like a great idea. And now I'm like, no, God, republics sound like an awful idea. Look at them. Yes. Do you want to be like time. France? Do you want President Macron? Well, President I mean, Biden? The Americans over, uh, well, seceded from the, from the monarchy so that they would be able to form a republic and uh, undo themselves from the tyranny that they were <laughs> experiencing with, what, a 3% tax? <laughs> and now how much are you all taxing yourselves? Because, oh, I guess if the people voted for it... Biden's it must private army of IRS agents. Yes, ready to knock you. on your door. Where did that $600 yeah. go, says Nancy Pelosi? Yeah. yeah. But the, 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 whole, the whole thing, like, Americans do kind of treat George Washington like a king as well. Well, they, that, they do kind of honour him like a king. Oh, and certain others like JFK is kind yeah. of deified as yeah. well. But I think Washington himself stepped down after four years in his first term specifically because he said he didn't want to be a king. Yeah. He didn't want people to see him that way. Too bad, Washington. People yeah. kind of see you yeah. that way anyway. Yeah. Perhaps it would have actually been a better idea if you had become a king, let's be honest, at this point. Uh, but they say at the end of here, perhaps the success of the monarchy lies in its ability to offer people a sense of stability in what is otherwise an ever-changing world. And I'd certainly say that's part of it. Oh, yeah. And for a publication like CBS, that's not a bad conclusion, certainly from what I would expect from them. And uh, any anti-monarchist sentiment and pro-republic sentiment that might be going on, I can say with pretty much certainty that I don't think we'll ever get as bad as it did during the 1600s. <laughs> <laughs> we'll never go back to that ba that period. No, but um, but that was Charles trying to import French monarchical ideology well, into yes. England. Uh, whereas I, I, I could talk about this for hours, but, uh, but it, the, the English monarch was never an absolute monarch, and uh, it was French monarchical absolutist ideology was trying, that Charles had adopted. And uh, that caused a civil war. That's how much the English don't agree with well, that. Well, yeah, th those kings in the past who did try and assert absolute power over the populace were kind of reined in. That's how you get something like the Magna Carta, isn't it? Oh, yeah. The, like, all of English constitutional history has essentially been trying to reset the Norman monarchy into the Anglo-Saxon monarchy. 
Mm. Like the Anglo-Saxon monarchy was not like you know overreaching or tyrannical, uh, and the Normans came along with French ideas. And well, they had to be stopped. Yeah, we'll get on to that as we carry on because I, I did find a magnificent thread that on Twitter that's just going through each little tweet is just a little miniature biography oh, yeah. Yeah. of a king, okay. and it's it's kind of wonderful how when you go back far enough a lot of these people obviously we've got the ceremony we've got the pomp we've got the tradition that's been built up over a thousand years but you go back to the say 800s 900s some of these people are just guys like you see them die in just like a fist fight at a pub somewhere <laughs> occasionally yeah <laughs> which is um, some of them die in battle some of them die in battle but there's a there's a long history of these uh, being people yeah not gods in themselves no, not at all. but and, uh, and you can go back to the, I, i'm going to do a thing but this goes back to tacitus when his description of germania where he says look the the german the germanic as in the anglo-saxon monarchs are not absolute rulers and they they don't even like actually dispense justice it was the priests that dispensed justice and pre-christian uh time you know they 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 were there to to you know essentially be a symbol of unity and so it, like the whole thing it, it, it's not really very different to like 2,000 years ago, actually, in ethos, at the very least. No, but we, we've also mentioned some of the filthy Republicans and their arguments. And um, their arguments always amuse me because there is this website, republic.org, <laughs> and if you scroll down, you can see their, uh, their latest video, Why the Monarchy Must Go. Oh. I mean, maybe a bit soon here, lads. Yeah. But, but what, uh, Just as a quick thing here, right? So the United Kingdom, as in the, the political body that is Britain exists because of the monarchy. Without that, there's no reason for England, Scotland, and Ireland, and Wales to have any kind of political union. So if... Because, I mean, initially it was the union of the crowns between England and Scotland. England uh, having Wales as a, essentially a province of it, a, a princedom. Uh, and so without that, why would we have that? So you wouldn't have a Republic of Britain. You would have an English Republic. And can you imagine just... I've said it before, but how far right an English Republic is going to be. That'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, you know, I mean, Peter the Scottish Hitchens, Republic's going to be a communist hellhole. Peter Hitchens has at times suggested that we should just secede yeah, from I'm, the United Kingdom. Yeah, I, I, I've said this as well. Like, I'm sure he's stealing my lines here, but like a Kingdom of England would be a very different thing not having Scotland and Wales in it. No, it absolutely. Would. I, would, I would say they're, they're tearing us down, pulling us down with them. It's, it's not even pulling us down, it's pulling us to the left. You know, like, if it was... If, if the political entity was England, it'd be a much more conservative place. Of course, I don't want Scots influencing my politics. What? Not normally, <laughs> but, but anyway. Uh, but they, they ask here, why do we want a republic? And there will be no prizes to anybody who guesses the answer. And it is simple. Hereditary public office goes against every democratic principle. Oh, I don't care. Yeah, I don't care. Democracy is not the be-all uh, be and end-all. And just because... God that failed, some might argue. Yes, and simply because people have convinced themselves that we are uh, at the forefront of history, where yeah. the most enlightened thinkers to have ever existed, will not change the reality of democracy not being the uh, best tool for every occasion, shall I mean, we say. Hitler was elected. No. What now? And <laughs> like, what do you want? I would say there's uh, referring to Hopper, who wrote Democracy: The God That Failed. He he suggests that um, to succeed in politics means becoming an incredibly effective sociopath and liar. Mm. So if you're able to succeed in politics, the likelihood is that you're not a particularly good person. Whereas yeah. on the other hand, a monarch who is raised from birth to be a ruler, to be a leader, to uh, behave and uh, behave in the appropriate ways. They, yes, you can get tyrants, and this is what people sure. like the Republicans always point to. Oh, we've got tyrannical leaders in the past. Yeah. Yes, but we've also got plenty of do-nothing leaders who basically just sat around and spent a bunch of money and didn't really do anything good or bad, which is, if you're just wanting stability, pretty much okay. And then there are plenty of people who are just good people. Yeah, I mean, you, you get, like genuinely good leaders who do good things and it's like i would rather a king alfred than a parliament that we've got now yeah i'd rather oh, king alfred God. than another boris yeah or exactly God forbid liz truss wherever she's going to be taking I don't, I don't even dislike liz truss really it's just i don't want these people to be like you know i don't want to pledge allegiance to liz truss <laughs> 
like, you know, Joe Biden. I wouldn't, or... I wouldn't have hand in heart in no. front of a portrait of Liz Truss, well, well, that's well, for sure. That's the thing, like, the elected head of state, like, you've got to pledge allegiance to a partisan actor. And I, like, I don't like that idea, actually. You know, the... I mean, look, they say we can't hold the Queen and her family to account at the ballot box. There's nothing to stop them abusing their privilege. It's like, like I, I, I've seen this argument. I've had this argument with a few like Republicans. Like, oh, well, you're a slave to the Queen. It's like, how the hell is she enslaving me, dude? Like, I do what I want all day, every day. You know, it feels like Parliament's enslaving yeah, yeah. me, pa- raising my taxes. Parliament are the ones raising your taxes. Yeah. They're the ones telling Hate you laws, you're you know? not allowed to go and out, go outside and yeah. socialize with certain people. Yeah. D- the Queen didn't a... put lockdowns in place. No, like, sorry. she didn't. Uh, and yeah. once again, as as if the ballot box is going to be the ultimate arbiter yeah. of good decision making, yeah. it's n- yeah. is nonsense. And they made a statement about the Queen's death, saying proclamation of a new king is an affront to democracy. Good. good. <laughs> a moment that stands firmly against the values that most of us believe in values such as equality accountability and the rule of law accountability and the rule of law were basically established under monarchy oh yeah and equality is not something i care about no equality is a, a again another a false, false god. god yeah, yeah. It, it's a total it's a total nothing but yeah you are exactly right and you can you can feel them right here with their fingers yeah. crossed begging they go the queen's the most popular member of the royal family <laughs> once she's gone Nobody's gonna like Charles. Oops! It looks like the uh, actually polls, everyone does. Yeah, 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 the polls that you brought yeah. up a moment ago yeah. show that actually people do yeah. quite Two-thirds like Charles. Two thirds of the country are like, yeah, we'll give him a good shot. But the, what, what's interesting is in the 14th century, I think it was that the king was finally subject to laws he was responsible for enforcing to his laws. Right, the king was made subject to his own laws. Was that the beginning of parliamentarianism? I believe so. Yeah. Yeah, I would and imagine. So, and so it's just like going like, oh, we want the rule of law. It's like you want a monarchical concept then, an English monarchical concept. Like you didn't get that in France or in Germany or in Italy or wherever else. But you got that here. And so what you're saying is, I want English traditionalism when you say rule of law. Well, yeah. And the the other aspect is they always refer to well, divine right of kings means they can just do whatever they want. Yeah, but that's French. Yeah. That's not how things work here. Yeah, the, the how things work <laughs> That's here. That's why King John was sat running me, being like, you're signing this document. And the Pope's <laughs> like, oh, we're going to overturn it. It's like, don't care. You know, who cares what the Pope bloody thinks? Well, I mean, they, they, uh, I would say the monarch has a divine duty to God, being the head of the church, sure. which, if, if anything, is something to restrain them. Yeah. It's, it's not like... That doesn't mean they have absolute power over every aspect of their subjects' lives. And in this country, it never has meant. No, but and I, when it did mean that, we had a civil war. I, I also think, and this is something that's changed about the way that I view things recently, mm. certainly it got me thinking after the Queen's death, the role of a monarchy in the uh, and, uh, and the head of state sorry, just, just, sorry, sorry to, sorry to, sorry to interrupt up, but it just struck me like these people like yeah we really don't like Louis the 14th and it's like okay now do I <laughs> like because right we, yeah I mean, <laughs> he's not our king exactly like Louis the 14th was like 1704 or something like that, that sort of you know 1700 that sort of time and it's like okay you're having an argument with the French hundreds of years ago I mean, that was after the English Civil War. Louis XIV was like, I am the state. And we'd already cut off one king's head. And we brought Charles back on the understanding, no, no, look, there's a there's a way of doing things. It's the Magna Carta way of doing things. So these people aren't, aren't even having an argument with the British monarchy. Just, it just struck me all of a sudden. Sorry. No, no, you're absolutely right. And like I said, I, I've been thinking about it a bit more recently. I've been doing some reading and it's changed my perspective on a few things that um i i do can still consider myself a libertarian but i think you can be <laughs> a monarchist and a libertarian well, I think at the Hopper same t- shows that you yeah can. A- absolutely he does yeah. but i do think that people uh, th- this is a fundamental misunderstanding of what people want in govern- uh, governance so yeah. people want to have a greater meaning in their lives and they defer to a higher authority through that whether it be god a king or what's dethroned to your, those your both. own father your own father but i think what in most in a lot of people nowadays because of this enlightenment mentality that many people are in uh, democracy as a concept has dethroned god and yeah. the king for a lot of people sadly because th- i don't think democracy is uh, i think democracy is deficient in fulfilling those Obviously. desires and impulses yeah. that people want and most people so whether they think about it on a daily basis or not were affected more uh, more by the queen's death than they expected to because of the fact that they see uh, they s- feel that they mm. feel that they want somebody they feel like the queen is in a, in a sense their mother mm. or their grandmother for yeah, a lot yeah. of people so they do feel it very personally 
And what I find interesting about the Republicans is like the, uh, oh, we want the people to decide. Okay, we're going to go and ask Barry Stanton what he wants. He's like, I want to elect a king. There now you what? Go. You know, you like go. North FC are not like, you know, French, you know, intellectual Republicans. They're like, no, want, want me king. You know, love me Commonwealth. Simple as. Yeah, simple as. Because they recognise that the Queen was someone who dedicated every single day of her life mm -hmm. to serving this country. She was not somebody who had arbitrary power to do whatever she wanted. She was, if in, in essence, a servant to the people. Mm as is proper. Yeah. She, uh, you know, she had to sacrifice a lot. Her family abdicated. Edward, who was supposed to take the throne, abdicates, and then all of a sudden she goes from just being a princess to being the next in line to the throne, and that changes her life entirely, and she still stepped up. In many ways, it is a gilded cage. It absolutely like, is. I'm a lot more free than the Queen was. Yeah. I can do what I want. You know? And uh, I've, I've referenced Hopper a few times, and I think he sums something up quite nicely here, which is if, if you're a conservative and you believe in the idea of hierarchy and there being a natural order to things, you kind of have to accept this view of looking at things. And I'm just going to read yeah. a quote from this that... I hope you'll agree with where he says conservative refers to someone who recognizes the old and natural through the noise of anomalies and accidents and who defends supports and helps to preserve it against the temporary and anomalous within the realm of the humanities including the social sciences a conservative recognizes families and households uh, based in uh, property and cooperation within a community of other households as the most fundamental natural essential ancient and indispensable social unit. Moreover, the family household also represents the model of the social order at large. Just as a hierarchical, or, uh, hierarchical order exists in a family, so there is a hierarchical order within a community of families of apprentices, servants, masters, vassals, knights, lords, overlords, and kings, tied together by an elaborate and intricate system of kinship relations and of children, parents, priests, patriarchs, popes, and finally the transcendent God. And I think that's a very nice way of putting it. Uh, and it's I also true. It, it is very true. <laughs> you can recognize this, whether people want to deny the idea of hierarchy or smash it all together. People defer to the higher authorities. The, there is never... A, I mean, humans are intrinsically hierarchical. And this is the thing. Well, I don't tend to talk about hierarchy because it's just there's, there's often just no point. It's like talking about you know what color the sky is today, you know. It's like I watched a, a Vice News documentary about Antifa, right? These are you know a few years ago, Antifa were coordinating to overthrow systems of oppression, and the women in the Antifa uh, commune were complaining that there was a hierarchy in the commune and the men were learning how to throw the Molotovs while they were making the Molotovs in the kitchen. <laughs> and it's like, even if even the communist revolutionaries can't avoid hierarchy, I think that John Peterson might be right and it might be intrinsic. It might just be built into us. Yeah. And you can't just focus on, ooh, he said lobster. Yeah. No, it's just true. And the thing is, the great lie of the smashing of hierarchies, of democracy being the only thing, seems to be coming down in front of people's very eyes, because you well, sent this through to me. Oh, before we go on to that, just a very quick thing, right? That That's interesting, isn't it? Like, it is a great lie. Like, we're going to get rid of all the hierarchies and smash hierarchies. No, what you want to do is just replace one hierarchy with another, right? And so, okay, well, that's, that's the honest assertion of left-wing uh, ideology. And so, okay, well, what do you want to replace it with? Well, we want to replace it with what? People's assemblies? You know, we want to place, we've got a parliament. We, we want to just, yeah, we've got the parliament, yeah. and we see how that goes. It just turns into pe people childishly yelling at one another. Or worse, it turns into people executing one another for being insufficiently pure and dogmatic to ideology a la the French Revolution, right? And so it's like, right, so what we've got is actually a really stable, long lived system in which I'm free. You know, I'm actually free to own my property, work my business, you know, spend time with my friends, enjoy well, for my. for now. Yeah, until the leftists get control of everything. Uh, but the point is, like, you know, historically, like, Burke has this great line in uh, Reflections on the French Revolution, where he's like, you know, uh, he, he gets a letter from someone in France. He's like, well, I, until this point, I thought I lived in a free country, but I've been told that I'm not free, and I don't. And I'm, and it's like, he's, a, you know, he's a, an intellectual, an aristocrat, a politician. And he's like, well, I thought I lived in a free country. And it's like, no, 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 it's not a free country. It's like, of course it's a free country. And those, those people telling you that you're not living in a free country, your freedom isn't true freedom, all they're doing is they're manipulating you so that they can get you under their thumb. They're trying to sell you utopia, so you'll tear down what you've got. But as again, as Burke points out, look, all the good things that we inherit, these are like 
they build up over time and that's what the tradition contains is a lot of good things that it it is difficult to replace and so when the left is like right we want a new hierarchy if they're not saying we want to abolish hierarchy as a concept even though that's the lie what they're asking for is a new hierarchy but what's the new hierarchy based on what's it it's based on adherence to a certain dogma it's like right i don't actually like that view of their hierarchy i don't i don't want what they're offering even if i thought they were competent which i don't and i thought they could put it in place which i don't think they can i think it'll be exactly the same as everywhere else and you end up look you end up with something like china you know, at the end of it. And it's like, look, I just don't like it, don't trust it. I do trust that which we've had since time immemorial and that I'm familiar with and I can feel safe in. Right? Yeah, even appealing to something like a hierarchy of merit, which is something that people on the right often do, yeah. can fall flat on its face at times. Yeah. Because if you've got a meritocracy of politicians, you might just end up with a meritocracy of people who are really good at screwing you over. Well, that's the thing. Like, at no point am I going to expect, and no one, it would be the most amusing thing to say is agents of the king will kick down our door or anyone's door owen jones's door dr shola's door and drag them out and disappear them right that's never going to happen that's no. never going to happen you know but if communists took over your country agents of the communist party absolutely would kick down our door and drag us away and then we'd disappear yeah. all you need to do is read solzhenitsyn and to hear exactly. first-hand tales of Ex that happening it, it happened during the french revolution happens during in, in russia happens in china happens in cuba happens in you know uh, cambodia ev everywhere everywhere that the communists take over that happens but in the british constitutional monarchy that doesn't happen so why would i choose the opposite mm, that doesn't happen until the democratic institutions start to consolidate and centralise their power. Exactly. Which is why it actually makes me hopeful to see that young adults have a dramatic loss of faith in UK democracy recently. And I'm sure... <laughs> I'm sure... I'm hopeful because people have got a lot of faith in democracy. I'm sure yeah. that most of these people are probably saying, oh, there's still inequality, they've not redistributed yeah. the wealth yet. But perhaps yeah. this does speak to something deeper that people are recognising that, hold up, this isn't always the best way of doing things. Perhaps sometimes we do need to defer to a leader who's been raised from birth to know what they're doing rather than a bunch of blubbering blowhards the like thing we is, get. The thing is, because these people come from privileged backgrounds, these people will often be raised in the sort of Etonian way, which is essentially what you're asking for. Right? Mm. And so the, I think... I, I think there's a difference, though. There's a difference between being raised to be the basically the owner and, mm. and the ruler say like a monarch would be and being raised to be a caretaker mm. of the country these two different attitudes breed different methods i, th I think the problem is I, what was i reading the other day that was talking about this and the, the the problem with democracy is essentially that the the focus becomes uh wrongly aligned on becoming re-elected and you get short-term goals that you're trying to go for. Whereas a oh, monarch, because yeah, yeah. they know that, well, te 50 years down the line, I'm still going to be monarch. Or I'm going to pass it on to my children. Yeah, it's much more long-term. But it, it's not, it, it just, it, it wrongly aligns the incentives. And then you've got the other problem, which is, okay, what if you're in a safe seat? Well, then I can just be corrupt. If yeah. I know that everyone in this borough is going to vote Labour forever... Like Claudia uh, Webb, for uh, instance. Exactly. Claudia Webb shouldn't have a career as a politician. She's awful, and yet she's going to be there forever because everyone there is just going to vote Labour because they do. And that's again, that's that's what actually makes Boris Johnson such a disappointment. It's like, look, if you flip a bunch of Labour seats like you did, you, you know, everything's on the table. You should have done something with it. But anyway. And look to something. And even the new statesmen of all, of all places seem to be through gritted teeth... <laughs> admitting that oh the young people they don't like democracy anymore they're starting to fail oh my goodness yeah you know so once again coping and ste uh, coping and seething and then i found this mega thread which rory shared on twitter which i thought was oh, excellent. the cultural so, tutors a very good account yes one tweet biography of every english and british monarch since alfred the great in 1886 and just this this first image here is absolutely fantastic. If you scroll down so we can see that, that tapestry of faces of our rulers. And that's, Rory puts it quite well. This shows in itself why it is that the monarchy is so important to England and why we need it, is the continuity. Mm. The fact that we can trace back our history and our heritage over a thousand years and understand the lives and, and um, achievements mm. of all of these people is something that we should be proud of. Yeah, and there, there, are, there are plenty of monarchs that are genuinely impressive people as well. 
you know, like Henry V there, you know, Richard the Lionheart there, you know, Edward I. There are, lo- there are loads of them who are genuinely impressive and actually did good things. But anyway, let's carry on. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I was just going to go through a few of these. So we had all the way back in 1886 through 1899, Alfred the Great, who mm-hmm. united the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms, fought off Viking invasions. Uh, they kept the Dane law in northern Ingl- England, but he yeah. did see over- uh, oversee many important reforms and traditionally is thought of as the first king of England. Alf- Alfred was genuinely amazing. Like, he was an actual philosopher. Uh, and he he translated the Bible into Anglo-Saxon. Oh, really? Out of Latin, yeah. My so, goodness. And he sent that around the country. He yeah instituted like a bunch of uh, legal reforms. And he had a very humble attitude. He was like, oh, I didn't really innovate any laws. I just collected the laws we had, uh, it, the established customs of the land. I didn't really want to innovate because I didn't know that they would be happy, uh, well accepted by the people who come after me. What a, what, a, what a thoughtful way of looking at things. Yeah. And you go to people like Edgar the Peaceful, who it says was in 959 to 975. His coronation in 973 created the tradition, which continues to the present day, mm. which, once again, we can just trace it all the yeah. way back to over a thousand years well, ago. We've actually just been covering all of this on uh, Bo's Epoch series on the website. Uh, we, we, we're, we're just about to come to William the Conqueror. In it. We've been going through oh, really the Anglo Saxon kingdoms from Alfred uh, through Ethelstan to uh, Ethelstan being like the first proper king of England, really. King of all England. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, he's been reading. Edward. He's been reading Anglo Saxons by Mark Morris, and yeah, I've got a copy got of it, that. Yeah. I need to give it a, yeah. give it a read because it's just fascinating, yeah. and it's like I say, it's it makes me proud to know yeah. where we come from, to know well, our heritage, and the sh- envy of every other country. I swear to God. Yes, no one else can really boast such an unbroken lineage, really, can they? And then you get to people like Edward the Confessor, uh, who was the final king of the House of Wessex, through to Harold Godwinson, who I believe made an agreement yeah, he, with William that, oh, don't worry, I'll, I'll just keep the throne warm for you, bro. And well, then crowns himself. It, it's hard to know. Like, very briefly, Edward the Confessor spent a lot of time in Normandy and was uh, married to Emma of Normandy. And so, actually, William may have actually had the legitimate claim oh, over really? Harold Godwinson, who was uh, Edmund Godwin's, or Godwine's, uh, like, essentially tried to usurp it. Uh, it. It's not... We can't be sure, because, again, this was a thousand years ago. Uh, but it, it may well be that, um, actually, William was the rightful successor. William so might have been in the didn't right. didn't kids of his own, you know? So... Oh. Very interesting. Yeah. yeah. Although uh, I, I, I've got to say, I've got a, a soft spot for Harold Godwinson because I, I thought he was great. Anyway. I need to, I need to read up more on this stuff because it makes me very proud to know all of this, but I don't know anywhere near as much as oh, I yeah. should. Well, this is this is why you should go check out Bo's Epochs, man. No, I do need to listen. No, no, to he, he, it's really good. And the thing, the thing you notice about the 11th century is it's just, it's an entire century where there are just hard men, serious men doing serious things all over the world. It's really epic. Yeah, and then... Uh, Hollywood should make movies of these people. They absolutely should, but it's... I mean, you'd have to cast only English people, or uh, or at least no, no, only only French European people, things. I should say, which... No, there, there are loads of people, all, like like um, Harold Hardrada, the Viking, the last great Viking king, who Godwinson defeats at the Battle of Stamford Bridge. He spends half of his life as, like... Um, a guard for the Byzantine Empire, for the the Varangian Guard, and it, 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 he took apparently quote eighty castles and cities in Syria, like for the Emperor. Oh, really? Of the Eastern... Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, the, the, and these people had unbelievably epic lives, and like all over the Middle East, you we know, need to celebrate this and far Africa, more than Sicily. we do. Exactly, it's not just Northern Europe that exists in like 1100. We need to bring back historical epics. Yes, so we do. They're, they're not in vogue anywhere near as much as no, they should. No, it sucks, be. doesn't it? Yeah, it does. You, and then you can go to uh, Bad King John, as he's known yeah. as, in 1199 to 1216, the son of Henry and brother of Richard, who lost his father's Angevin Empire. Uh, I, did I pronounce that right? Angevin. Ang- uh, Angevin. Yeah, that's the the yeah the the empire of uh, yes. Bad King John, of course. That's where the three lions comes from. Oh, the heraldry. Really? Ah, yes. Uh, and we, yeah, so we controlled more of France than the French did. 
Uh, oh, glorious days. Yeah, it, well, it was, yeah, yeah, it was. Until, uh, of course, King John came to the throne. Yes, and then the nobles rebelled and forced him to sign the Magna Carta mm -hmm. in 1215, which uh, is foundational to our constitutional system and English rights as yeah, well. Yeah, he wasn't Robin Hood's nemesis, even though he is often predicted, uh, <laughs> depicted as it. Robin Hood, the only king that's mentioned in Robin Hood is Edward. Edward I, maybe, I don't know, who knows. But... Um, but yeah, isn't it interesting though that England didn't need a formalised constitutional system before the Normans? Like it's just going to show you that there's there's habits and customs that were just abided by, as Alfred points out. And it's it's only with the Normans coming over and trying to do it in French ways, we're like, no, we're going to have a constitutional system. Yeah, well, before then, people just things just uh, behaved as they should. Yeah, it was custom as, and tradition, as was proper yeah. for things. And then you can go all the way through to some of the greatest hits, like Henry the Eighth. Uh, oh, we're missing out Edward the First, Edward the oh, Third, can... Henry the Fifth. Well, we've only got a certain <laughs> amount of time. I just thought I'd go <laughs> like, through some, <laughs> like the great conquering Richard, yeah, Richard I mean, the Lionheart. If, you, if you'd the, like the, to take over, the great from conquering here. kings of England, and we're le we're leaving them at no, 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 carry on. No, we're no, I'll say Henry the Eighth is fine. Oh, that's fine. No, I was just I was mentioning. <laughs> well, we've only got a limited amount of time. You've Kenneth Branagh being the iconic uh, representation of Henry V there, by the way. Yes. Yeah, so, but, uh, I mean, I could go. we could go on about a lot of these yeah. people for ages, but yeah. it's, just a, it's just a reminder of the history that is in this land and the heritage and culture that we all share. And, the, and my point is that the monarchy is a direct link to the past and something that we can all share between us that unites us in common, han uh, common ancestry. Mm. And I think as well, and I can only... I can only speculate, but I think you can unite us in a shared hope for the future. If you appreciated that segment from the podcast of the Lotus Eaters, you can go to lotuseaters.com to get access to all the premium content we have on the site, such as Carl's speech that he gave at the Witten on The Word and the Shire. And if you don't want to follow what else Carl's putting out, you can follow him on Getter at Carl Benjamin on Getter. Thank you and goodbye.